so my name is Nick Lesmeister. I want to welcome all of you who are here. We're just crossing over 100 people. We expect uh, some more to join in with us here soon. Uh, I am the director of the Gateway Center for Israel, which is a new initiative of uh, Gateway Church. And um, this really is, uh, it was a merger. We just launched in January of this year, six months ago. And we took a long legacy ministry that was actually born out of the heart of Pastor Robert and Dr. Wayne Wilkes in the 90s called the Messianic Jewish Bible Institute that Dr. Brown was a teacher at. And we merged together with Gateway's global Jewish ministry to create the Gateway Center for Israel. And uh, our vision is to inspire the church, the global church, to a biblical and sincere love for Israel and the Jewish people. And we are positioned a little uniquely in that we have the, really the blessing of being able to have a foot in the door of uh, the King's University, which is uniquely a part of Gateway Church. And my overseer at Gateway, Dr. Wayne Wilkes, is, uh, has a role at the King's University as the special advisor to the president on church and Jewish relations. And so we're really excited to host tonight with the King's University Messianic Jewish Studies Program under the directorship of Dr. David Rudolph, this event, the rising tide of Christian anti-Semitism. And when I think about our mission and our vision to inspire the church to a biblical and sincere love for Israel and the Jewish people, this is ultimately the opposite of that. So we feel so honored to have Dr. Brown with us and really to take time to address this issue that's been on the rise and uh, to explore some of the things that are in the church's past. And I think really there's, there's, uh, this is a great time to discuss this as we're really doing a lot of soul searching as a nation and looking into some of the injustices that have hurt both the, the body of Messiah, but also those who've interacted with us. So uh, I wanna introduce Dr. Michael Brown. And um, before I do that, real quickly, I do wanna say a little bit about the King's University Messianic Jewish Studies Program. I mentioned Dr. David Rudolph is the director and he'll be joining us later as we get into the Q&A time. Um, but uh, this is a co-sponsored event with us at the Center for Israel and the TKU Messianic Jewish Studies Program. And it's part of the annual lecture series on, church, on the church and the Jewish people. So this is uh, something we do every year uh, that Dr. Rudolph oversees. And TKU offers online courses on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And Dr. Brown is teaching this TKU summer course on the new anti-Semitism. So uh, really excited about the work of Dr. Rudolph and everything that's happening at the King's University, particularly on this topic, which is very cutting edge in a seminary program. And so we're excited about that. And I do want to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Brown, who's such a close friend of ours at Gateway and has been really a close friend to us and Dr. Wayne Wilkes for decades. And, but Dr. Brown is someone that we look to um, on such a variety of topics. I was just teaching a, a webinar to a church in London the other day, and they asked me for who should they uh, you know, listen to as far as resources, and I always recommend Dr. Brown. He's the founder and president of Ask Dr. Brown Ministries and Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina, and the host of the daily nationally syndicated talk show, The Line of Fire, where he serves as your voice of moral culture and spiritual revolution. He hosts TV on God TV, Middle East TV, and NRB TV. He's the author of 37 books. There might be one more now that since we saw this bio, Dr. Brown. <laughs> and he holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University and has served as a visiting or adjunct professor at seven leading seminaries. He's widely recognized as today's foremost Messianic Jewish apologist, to which I would overwhelmingly agree. And I believe what makes Dr. Brown someone that I love to recommend is his heart of sincerity, his love for the Jewish people that is uh, never apologetic, but uh, is always very kind and always very welcoming. And so it's really an honor for us to have you with us, Dr. Brown. I'm going to turn my video off and let you take it away. And we will join you uh, in about an hour for the Q&A session. Thank you. Great. Well, wonderful to be with all of you. And uh, we had uh, 422 folks registered uh, for this um, maybe 10 minutes before we were actually starting. And uh, that uh, was a good number because John 4.22 is salvation is of the Jews. So maybe there are more that have registered since then, but 
We're glad to have all of you joining us. And uh, it's always a joy to do anything with Dr. David Rudolph. Uh, I remember when he was an undergrad student of ours in Maryland at Messiah Biblical Institute and Graduate School of Theology. And he went on from there, turned his uh, PhD at Cambridge, and, and he does such excellent a scholastic work on, on Messianic Jewish issues, New Testament theology, and uh, King's University really stands out uh, for their job in this respect. So great, great joy to partner together with Gateway. Uh, ac actually, there was kind of a low level event at Gateway earlier this week, uh, not that big a deal, where, where they hosted President Trump and a, a panel of African-American leaders and others we're discussing race relations in America. This is kind of a low level event now, now the, the big event here. Uh, but we would have been down there with you in person. Uh, the plan was that I'd be teaching face to face Monday to Wednesday, and that tonight we would do an open to the public lecture. So because of still restrictions with virus and other things like that, uh, we're doing it this way, but hopefully reaching even more people in doing this. You're gonna find this eye opening. You're gonna find this very intense. You're gonna find this troubling, but encouraging in the end. So we'll pray together. Father, we look to you now for wisdom, for insight, as we talk about a tremendously controversial and difficult subject, the rising tide of contemporary Christian anti-Semitism. Lord, this must grieve your heart. We know how it grieves our hearts. We know how the enemy wants to use this in so many destructive ways. So give us wisdom, give us insight, give us understanding. In Yeshua's name, amen. Many of you know my testimony. I came to faith in 1971. I was a heavy drug user, heroin shooting, LSD using, hippie rock drummer, 16-year-old Jewish kid. And my dad was thrilled to see me off drugs, but he said, Michael, we're, we're Jews, we don't believe this. And he in turn uh, introduced me to the local rabbi was about 11 years older than me, fresh out of Jewish theological seminary. We were just in touch again a few weeks ago, actually. And immediately, he began to talk to me about anti-Semitism in the church. Now, because I was raised in a Jewish home, I didn't know a lot of church history. And in my own experience, I didn't encounter a lot of anti-Semitism growing up on Long Island, our community was basically all Jewish, over the bridge was all Gentile, but we went to school together, we hung out together, never really felt any of that tension. And the church where I got saved was an Italian Pentecostal church, so not from a historic denomination, not with a church that would look to a, a certain history like Catholics would, or, or a history from Reformation on like, like Presbyterians might, or Methodists or others might. And so I, I had no concept of church history, and the people in the church where I came to faith were, were full of love for Jewish people, really believed that God had brought the Jewish people back to the land with modern Israel. And honestly, as I've traveled around the world now and, and been preaching since 73 and traveling extensively around the world a couple hundred times since probably the mid 80s overseas, I've consistently run into supernatural, beautiful, wonderful love for Israel and the Jewish people. It seemed as if so much of what happened in church history was no longer relevant today, except for a little fringe group here, an extreme voice here. But sadly, in the last year or two, I've confronted more, quote, Christian anti-Semitism, Christian despising of Jews and denigrating of Jews and hating of Jews. I've encountered that more in the last year or two than in the previous 47 or 48 years combined. So I, I want to briefly take you back in history, then I want to share with you where we are today, some of the shocking things that have happened, and, and then give you insight into how these things have happened, and then at the end, practically what we can do to make a difference. Now, if you have a question along the way, you can type it in at any point, and, and one of the gentlemen will be going through questions, or a couple will, and then at the end, we'll be pulling these questions out, and I'll be addressing them. So no need to wait to the end. If, if something comes up, uh, as long as the question is relevant to the lecture, just go ahead and, and post it. So let's um, get this up here for you to see. And remember, you can view where you can see me, and you can see the slide at the same time. So let's just briefly 
go through a few key dates in church history uh, to, to, to give you a feel of what's happened in the past and where we are today. Uh, the year 386 in Antioch, John Chrysostom began to preach his seven sermons against the Jews. Uh, Chrysostom was apparently concerned about Christians in his congregation attending synagogues or taking an interest in the Jewish holy days. There's some dispute as exactly what caused him to bring these messages. But he brought seven sermons against the Jews. There's actually an eighth. And in his first sermon, he said things like this. Indeed, the synagogue is less deserving of honor than any inn. It is not merely a lodging place for robbers and cheats, but also for demons. This is true not only of the synagogues, but also of the souls of Jews. He said, do you see that demons dwell in their souls and that these demons are more dangerous than the ones of old? And this is very reasonable. In the old days, the Jews acted impiously toward the prophets. Now they outraged the master of the prophets. Tell me this, do you not shudder to come into the same place with men possessed who have so many unclean spirits, who have been reared amid slaughter and bloodshed? Must you share a greeting with them and exchange or bear a word? When brute animals feed from a full manger, they grow plump and become more obstinate and hard to hold in check. They endure neither the yoke, the reins, nor the hand of the charioteer. Just so the Jewish people were driven by their drunkenness and plumpness to the ultimate evil, they kicked about, they failed to accept the yoke of Christ, nor did they pull the plow of his teaching. And he said this, although such beasts are unfit for work, they are fit for killing. And this is what happened to the Jews. While they were making themselves unfit for work, they grew fit for slaughter. This is why Christ said, but as for these, my enemies who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slay them. This is from one of the parables where Jesus speaks of judgment that will come ultimately on the Jewish people, the destruction of Jerusalem. It was Chrysostom who was given the, mouth, the name Golden Mouth after his death because he was so eloquent. Chrysostom is Golden Mouth that uh, apparently is the one to first bring the charge of deicide, killing God, because Yeshua is God, and the Jews killed Yeshua, therefore the Jews killed God. And, and what crime could be worse than deicide, and what punishment should those who commit deicide be worthy of receiving? Well, as the centuries go on, you have different discriminatory actions taken against the Jewish people. There is some persecution on some level, but you really have to wait for the Crusades, 1096, 1099, before things really heat up. And here's what happens. Uh, so in the year 1096, Susan Jacoby relates, Pope Urban II did not tell Crusaders to murder Jews, but that is what happened when at least 100,000 knights, vassals, and serfs, unmoored from ordinary social restraints, but bearing the standard of the cross, set off to crush what they considered a perfidious Muslim enemy in a faraway land. Why not practice on that older group accused of perfidy, unbelief, the Jews? So if you're going to march to the Holy Land to liberate it from the Muslims, you've, you've got worse infidels right in your own backyard that you've been living with side by side for generations, the killers of Christ. So the Crusades turned against Jewish people in Europe. And to this day, when Jews that know their history think of Jesus, think of Christianity, this is what often comes to mind. Uh, Albert of Aix, a Christian born in the late 11th century, describes atrocities in Mainz, another stop on the Crusaders' rampage through the Rhineland, by a band headed by one Count Emiko. Again, there is a bishop who initially promises the Jews protection for what Albert describes as an incredible amount of money, but Emmy Cohen, his Christian soul, was broken to the hall where the Jews were held. Quote, breaking the bolts and doors, they killed the Jews, about 700 in number, who in vain resisted the force and attack of so many thousands. They killed the women also, and with their swords pierced tender children of whatever age and sex. Again, what was their crime? They were Jews, and Jews, the Christ killers. Martin Luther was so repulsed by what he saw in Catholic church history and the way Catholics treated the Jews, that in 1523, he wrote a little book that Jesus Christ was born a Jew. 
And in it, he said that if he had been a Jew and seen the way these Catholics treated the Jews, he would have rather been a pig than a Christian. And he said, perhaps we can, we can win them. They're the elder brothers. After all, it was respectful. It was gracious. He wanted to emphasize that Jesus himself was born a Jew. But 20 years later, Luther did not see the results he was hoping to see. Luther concluded that whatever Paul meant by all Israel shall be saved in Romans eleven twenty six 26 must have meant something else because he saw no real hope of Jewish conversion, let alone mass conversion. He was also old and sick, and he had been shown literature, rabbinic literature, Jewish literature, that maligned Jesus, that spoke of him as a, as a bastard, that spoke of him burning in hell and excrement. And it was his impression that Jews cursed Christians in the synagogues every day. And he wrote in 1543, his next little book on the subject concerning the Jews and their lies. He explained to the German princes how to deal with this insufferable devilish burden, the Jews. So here's his counsel, excerpt it, 1543. First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools. This is Martin Luther. No one disputes this. No one argues that he wrote this. There's no question about that. This is Martin Luther. So the first thing he tells the German princes to do is set fire to their synagogues or schools. Now, if you fast forward to November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht in Germany, many historians say that's the real beginning of the Holocaust. And, and what did the Nazis do? They set fire to synagogues and to places of business, Jewish places of business. They did exactly what Luther counseled. He said, second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. Instead, that they might be lodged under a roof or in a barn like the gypsies. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry lies, cursing and blasphemy are taught be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth, henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. That's Martin Luther. And he said this, fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. Sixth, I advise that usury be prohibited to them and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them and put aside for safekeeping. Seventh, I recommend putting a flail, an ax, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle to the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses and letting them earn their bread and sweat of their brow. Now, concerning the Jews and their lies was repudiated by several of Luther's contemporaries. When it was translated into Latin, there were efforts to soften it. There were other horrific writings of Luther as well at that time that also spoke against the Jewish people. But over the centuries, Lutherans either ignored these and emphasized the 1523 book that Jesus Christ was born a Jew or they repudiated these. It was when the Nazis rediscovered Luther's writings that they brought this to the fore. You say, yeah, okay, but that's still the 1500s. That's still the past. And your lecture is about the rising tide of contemporary Christian anti-Semitism. Well, I said all that to prepare the way for this. October 2014, Tex Mars best-selling evangelical author and a Christian radio host, reprinted Luther's Concerning the Jews and Their Lies, writing an enthusiastic foreword. Yes, the things you just saw excerpted, he reprinted in full. Martin Luther, he says, one of the greatest champions of the Christian faith ever to live, wrote this amazing book to warn Christians of the darkness of the Jewish religion. And he, he describes on the Jews and their lives as Luther's magnificent defense of Jesus the Messiah and his expose of the unfounded lies and accusations of the rabbis. 2014. Poway, California, April 27th, 2019. John T. Ernest, just 19 years old, marches into an Orthodox Jewish synagogue in Poway and opens fire, killing one and wounding three before his gun locks up. Among the injured are an eight-year-old girl and the rabbi who lost a finger on one hand. According to a court affidavit, Ernest told the 9-11 emergency line dispatcher 
I just shot up a synagogue because Jewish people are destroying the white race. This is some of his manifesto. John Ernest, Orthodox Presbyterian. I did not choose to be a Christian. The Father chose me. The Son saved me. And the Spirit keeps me. Why me? I do not know. But as a Christian, he has a responsibility. Quote, there's no love without hatred. You cannot love God if you do not hate Satan. You cannot love righteousness if you do not also hate sin. You cannot love your own race if you do not hate those who wish to destroy it. Love and hate are two sides of the same coin. And he says, it is unlawful and cowardly to stand on the sidelines as the European people are genocided around you. I did not want to have to kill Jews, but they have given us no other option. Indeed, he claims, my God does not take kindly to the destruction of his creation, especially one of the most beautiful, intelligent, innovative races that he's created in the European, least of all at the hands of one of the most ugly, sinful, deceitful, cursed, and corrupt, which he means the Jews allegedly destroying whites of European origin. And uh, he goes on quoting scripture, scripture after scripture, to show how the Jews as Christ killers deserve this punishment. September 29th, 2019, a man named Robert posted this comment on my YouTube channel with reference to the Poway Synagogue shooting. It is so shocking that your people pulled another false flag shooting and made sure the perp was a violent quote Christian. We know how evil you are, Brown. So in other words, someone is claiming that Jews orchestrated this to try to make Christians look bad. And then to come full circle, October 2nd, 2019, a woman named Maria posted this comment on our YouTube channel, our Ask Dr. Brown YouTube channel. Dr. Brown, I hope you're humble enough to hear this video to the end, because I think you really need it. Her comment was linked to a six and a half hour video compilation containing the narration of all of John Chrysostom's sermons against the Jews. Uh, you see, friends, there is a rising tide of anti-Semitism in America and around the world. For years now, scholars have noted that levels of anti-Semitism worldwide are just as high as they were before the Holocaust. What makes it all the more shocking is that some of the anti-Semitism is on the lips of professing Christians, and that we can now see through social media how these comments resonate with others. I'm going to give you some shocking social media info in a moment. But friends, this is a plague. This is rising rapidly. This is spreading out of control. For months before the Poway shooting, I was warning these Christian anti-Semites that their rhetoric would lead to violence. And then the shooting, the first synagogue shooting, the Pittsburgh one, 2018 seem more to be white supremacists than Christian related. Sometimes they are, they are two sides of the same coin. But Poway was definitely carried out in the name of Christian faith. We've been warning that these things would lead to violence here in America. Tragically, they have. Let me break down some contemporary Catholic and evangelical anti-Semitism. I wrote the book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, the tragic story of the church and the Jewish people in 1992, that's when it was published. It's my most translated book. It's never gone out of print. And my heart in writing it was to break the hearts of readers, to give them a sense of what happened in church history so that they could be part of the solution and help pray for God's eternal purposes for Israel and the Jewish people to be fulfilled in Yeshua. The publisher approached me a couple of years ago and said, Dr. Brown, it would be great if you could do an updated, expanded edition. So I did, and that came out in September of 2019. That's what you see depicted there, the cover of the new edition. I have to tell you honestly, I, I was jarred in doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of what's happening in the world. I'm writing op-eds day and night. I'm on talk radio day and night. I'm interacting on social media. I'm quite aware of what's happening in the world around us. But to put it together and to see 
that some of the identical things that were happening when I wrote this book, say I, I wrote it in 91, came out in 92, that the same things are happening now, but with greater intensity. And that I could, I could refer to Louis Farrakhan's anti-Semitism then and today. I could refer to white supremacist anti-Semitism then, except now it leads to synagogue shootings. I, I could refer to Christian anti-Semitism in the past and now update it, update it, update it for today. It was very jarring. And there's so much going on that I ended up writing another book that will come out in October. Christian anti-Semitism confronting the lies in today's church. In other words, this whole book just focuses on today. First couple of pages, I, I take you through history like I just did, but the whole book is about what's happening today. As I said in the preface, this is a book I wish I didn't have to write. It's one thing to talk about the past. We can't go back and undo that. But what's, what's happening in front of our eyes, we can certainly do something about that. Dr. E. Michael Jones is the probably the most well-known Catholic anti-Semite. Now, he denies he's an anti-Semite because he said anti-Semitism is racial. That's what was initially coined. But anti-Semitism is Jew hatred. It doesn't have to be racial only. Here are some of the books Dr. Jones has written. And, and he's a solid uh, academic scholar. In other words, he's, he is not simply writing with, with no background. He was a university professor and, and got dismissed. He said overstand on abortion. In any case, here are some of his Jewish-related books. The Jews and Moral Subversion, The Catholic Church and the Jews, Catholics and the Jew Taboo, Jewish Fables, Darwinism, Darwin. Did you know that Darwinism was a Jewish fable? Darwinism, materialism, and other Jewish fables. Jewish privilege. Friends, trust me, the same one that's complaining about white privilege today will be complaining about Jewish privilege tomorrow. And I'm, I'm not dismissing all concerns of racism today, God forbid. I'm simply saying that the ones that will be accused of having the ultimate privilege, the Jews. Shylock's Jews and Rams, Economics and Morality, and the Jewish Revolutionary Spirit and its Impact on World History, 1,200-page book. I had gotten the book out of curiosity about it and began reading it. I was researching for a book on the power of music, and then I, I grabbed a quote from it and put it in because it was very relevant about music being used in communism and the communist revolution and so on only to realize later on, once the book was on its way to be published, who this was, because I had some of his other books about cultural issues that, that I agreed with a lot of. So we had to put a caveat in the footnote saying, I don't agree with this anti-Semitism. I just found this quote in the book, didn't realize who I was quoting in full. So Dr. Jones has popularized uh, this concept of logos rising. So logos in the New Testament, the, the wisdom of God, the mind of God, the morality of God, and that the Jewish people as a people in rejecting Jesus have rejected Logos and therefore they are by nature subversive rebels trying to overthrow God's order. And that in his view, every Jew at some point in life makes this choice, a conscious choice to reject Yeshua as the Messiah and thereby rejects Logos and thereby becomes a revolutionary in a destructive way to overthrow the order of God. And, and he has become very, very popular. He used to be extreme fringe, but now there's been a social media boom. He's become very popular. Uh, comedian Owen Benjamin, who is conservative morally and maybe recently became a Christian, has, has put out blatant anti-Semitic videos, horrific. And E. Michael Jones has been a source for him. Here's what the ADL says, and the tradition of conspiracy theorists Jones credits Jews with orchestrating occurrences as varied and disconnected from the Jewish experience as the Protestant Reformation. So Jews are behind the Protestant Reformation, according to Jones, and the French Revolution. He also blames Jews for Bolshevism, Freemasonry, and an alleged contemporary, quote, Jewish takeover of American culture. Jones argues that mass killings of Jews throughout history have been understandable reactions to Jewish beliefs and behavior. So he repeats the Catholic dictum of do no harm to the Jews while speaking in cindery words like this. He goes so far as to justify Eastern European pogroms and even the Nazi Holocaust on these grounds. As he wrote in the 2003 Culture Wars article, Culture Wars is his website, 
the Nazi attempt to exterminate the Jews was a reaction to Jewish messianism in the form of Bolshevism, every bit as much as the Kamenlicki pogroms flowed from the excesses of the Jewish tax farmers in the Ukraine. So this is what in the 17th century, these horrific pogroms, slaughters of the Jewish people, ah, it was because of the Jewish tax farmers were, they were, they were taking too much tax money. And, and, and here's what Jones says, why the Nazis did what they did. Suddenly these people, meaning the Jewish people are let loose, people like Magnus Hirschfeld are let loose. He was a, an early sex revolutionary, gay sex activist and things like that. People like Magnus Hirschfeld are let loose. And suddenly the people, meaning the German people are resentful. They don't want the corruption of their morals and they turn to someone like Hitler because he said he would straighten them out. This could have been stopped earlier. So it's the Jews fault, basically. The Holocaust is the fault of those evil Jews. He said the great uncle of Pope Benedict wrote a book with a German title, George Ratzinger, he said, if the church doesn't step in and defend the people by enforcing the laws that protect the moral order, the German people are going to look for a leader. Well, guess what the German word for leader is? It's Führer. They found their leader. This is the type of reaction we want to prevent here in America. And the way we prevent this is by open dialogue. where We were able to criticize the people who have subjected us to this reign of pornographic terror. The Jews are behind the sexual revolution. The Jews are behind pornography. The Jews are behind abortion. The Catholic Church was trying to help the German people pushed back against the, the Jews, but they weren't able to do it effectively enough, so the solution was Hitler. This is the madness of what's being said, friends. And it's not just in Iranian TV, press TV, where, where Jones, Dr. Jones has appeared numerous times. It's all over the internet. And his books are well received. Go, to, go look up the books I mentioned on Amazon, or just look at Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. Look at the ratings. Look at the reviews. Tex Mars reprinted the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, also the, the ultimate conspiracy theory against the Jewish people. Here are some of his books, Conspiracy of the Six-Pointed Star, and he became known by writing about New Age symbols, eye-opening revelations and forbidden knowledge about Israel, the Jews, Zionism, and the Rothschilds, DNA science and the Jewish bloodline, Holy Serpent of the Jews, the rabbi's secret plan for Satan to crush their enemies and vault the Jews to global dominion, blood covenant with destiny, the Babylonian Talmud, the Jewish Kabbalah, and the power of prophecy. Okay, let me read some of Mars to you. Of all the diseased schools of racial supremacism, I'm convinced that the Jewish specimen is the most evil and most threatening to the lives, bodies, and eternal destinies of humankind. Zionism has existed as a satanic ideological force in opposition to all things good and even to life itself for 3,000 years. Zionism and its accompanying religious disease, Judaism, are the champions of all time in terms of the total number of innocent men, women, and children being in prison and concentration camps, beaten, bludgeoned, raped, robbed, humiliated, and then mercifully slaughtered. If you think uh, there's no possible way that a thinking human being could write this or that a thinking human being could believe it, thinking human beings have written it and believe it, that is the insidious nature the diabolical nature of anti-Semitism. You say, where are they been getting these ideas from? Well, if you believe that the communist revolution was the work of the Jews, because you had Jews involved in instigating it, and Karl Marx with the Communist Manifesto, Jewish bloodline. So if the communist revolution is the work of the Jews, then everything communism certain subsequently does and all the tens of millions who were killed as a result of it, that's because of the Jews. Forget the fact that communism ruthlessly persecuted the Jews. Don't mention that. It's inconvenient. Morris said this, the ultimate goal of the Jews is the annihilation of almost every Gentile man, woman, and child and the establishment of a satanic Jewish-led global dictatorship, the Jewish utopia, encompassing the planet. This goal is expressed by the Jews in their most sacred books, the Babylonian Talmud and the Kabbalah. Yep. He said this, the Jewish majority hates humanity. They despise life. They hate God. Therefore, they are psychopaths and love death. The plan of the Jews is to employ the tools of chaos magic, Jews' deception, lies, money, craft, and magic to obtain their ultimate goal. That goal is the conquest of the Gentile world by Jews and the establishment of a holy serpent kingdom on earth. Whew. Here's what's even more frightening. If you hear Tex Morris preach the gospel, call people to repent and put their faith in Jesus, claim the Bible is the word of God, 
speak against other social evils of the day, you'd be in lockstep with him. You'd be side by side with him saying, amen, preach it, brother. And yet this is some of the sick anti-Semitic vitriol that proceeded from his mouth. No exaggerations here, friends. And then Rick Wiles and True News. I, I, I want to play a clip for you, but I want to set this up first uh, to say this. We have uh, on our Ask Dr. Brown YouTube channel about 110,000 subscribers and over 2,000 videos. And I, I just looked before doing the lecture tonight and our last 10 videos, the great majority are 97 to 98% thumbs up. One, I interviewed uh, a Christian activist who is a, a militant Trump opponent and says that Christians who vote for Trump are part of a cult. That got like 92% positive because of the controversy or 88% positive, but otherwise overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly in the mid to high 90s, because it's people who like my stuff and are watching it. Our, our Facebook page, Ask Dr. Brown, Ask Dr. Brown on Facebook. And if you cannot not connect, and I either, please do take a second and while you're online and, and, and like us, uh, Ask Dr. Brown, Ask Dr. Brown on Facebook, and then Ask Dr. Brown on YouTube, click subscribe there. Uh, but overwhelmingly, the people there agree with us, follow us. So we're always in the midst of controversy. That's fine. But, but people appreciate what we do. When we deal with controversy, we seek to deal with it honestly, fairly, uh, and, and, and speak the truth in love. So interestingly, we, we, went after, uh, we went after Rick Wiles and True News. And I'm just going to find this here. It's going to take me a split second. Here we are. Now, I, I want you to notice this. If you see on the screen, True, True News and Rick Wiles Exposed, we first went into a book he wrote in the year 2000, Y2K, how America was going to collapse to say, hey, it didn't happen then. The guy's not trustworthy. All right. And again, strong evangelical, known within evangelical circles for years as a committed evangelical, and then only recently just took up this extreme anti-Semitism. But I want you to see 48,626 views posted almost a year ago. And now look at the thumbs up versus thumbs down. You see that? 953 thumbs up, 1.5 thousand thumbs down. Whenever we post a video like this, almost invariably, with same with E. Michael Jones, we posted one about E. Michael Jones and Owen Benjamin, and one of two times only we had to shut off comments because they were so repeatedly vile and ugly and despicable. It's like, okay, we just, we can't be a platform for this because otherwise we let people go at it within boundaries. So uh, I, I want you to hear a clip from True News. True News and Rick Wiles. Judaism teaches racial superiority. Yes. That's what they teach. And they it's practice racial it on the Palestinians. Look, the Talmud is specific to say what Gentiles are, what the cattle do. They are slaves. Yes. This is a fact. So John Hagee just taught Talmudic teachings that he did, yes, non, yes, that Christians are obligated <laughs> to be slaves to Talmudic Jews. Does he think he's going to get special privileges? No, he's converted. I am convinced he's converted. I think he's a Talmudist. Oh, wait, where's the prayer show? I mean, a, a, I mean, a lot does all of this. these guys on, on so-called Christian TV, it's not Christian TV anymore. It's, it's just, it's, it's Jewish TV. They are Talmudists. They've converted. All right. Rick Wiles has a lot more to say, but I, I just wanted you to hear a little out of his mouth. And remember that video where we're exposing him Instead of the normal, if we had a thousand thumbs up, you know, maybe 50 or 100 thumbs down. No, it's the reverse, overwhelmingly negative. So let's go back to our presentation here. According to Rick Wiles, these are direct quotes. The power of the Israeli lobby in America is the most detrimental force in America. Our culture has been decimated through abortion, pornography, and the sexual liberation movement. Filthy, raunchy movies and television shows, vile, violent rap music and hip hop and all of it owned by the synagogue of Satan. Did you know that? Rap music is owned by Jewish people whom he calls synagogue of Satan. And I cannot be a preacher of the gospel and not confront the synagogue of Satan, even if it costs me my life. 
The day is coming when Christians are going to lose their lives as they confront the synagogue of Satan. You cannot stand for Jesus Christ and righteousness in this world without confronting the synagogue of Satan. Friends, if you thought I've been exaggerating anything, that quote alone, that quote alone should tell you there's a reason we're sounding the alarm. Rick Wiles, the Soviet Communist Party, was founded and run by Bolshevik Jews, and they killed tens of millions of Christians in Russia. Co-host, Matt Scow. When they scream, we want Mashiach now, Messiah now, their Messiah to come back as a political leader, they believe that these Goyim will be their slaves. Rick Wiles, they are teaching future military officers, officers messianic values, which means that they are they're instilling that the Jewish Messiah will be a military leader. Edward Saul, that's what Judas wanted. Matt Scow, that's why they rejected Jesus. Rick Wiles, they wanted to murder Romans. Ben Shapiro said they're looking for a military messiah. That's Gal. It's time to wake up, people. In other words, when Jews are praying for the messiah, they're looking for someone to, a military messiah who's going to kill all the Gentiles, starting with the Christians. Wake up. They, they are inciting people with these fears. Rick Wiles has talked about time to get armed, time to make sure you have your weapons. Talked about a civil war that could be coming be, before the end of last year because the impeachment hearings. And by the way, the Jews own Trump, according to Rick Wiles. The Jews own the White House. But what about the Jews? He said the impeachment hearings, that was a Jew coup to get rid of Trump. When confronted over it, he said, oh, yeah, the Jews own two different factions, the pro-Trump and the anti-Trump factions, but they're running both sides of what's happening in Washington. He said that's the way the Jews work. They are deceivers. They plot. They lie. These are all direct quotes. They do whatever they have to do to accomplish their political agenda. This impeach F Trump effort is a Jew coup. And the American people better wake up to it really fast because this thing is moving now toward a vote in the House and then a trial in the Senate. We could have a trial before Christmas. This country could be in a civil war at Christmas time. Members of the U.S. military are going to have to take a stand just like they did in the 1860s with the Civil War. They're going to have to decide, are you fighting for the North or the South? And then, friends, I get a call on the radio one day, and I, I am... I am asked about the seven laws of Noah. And is it true that Jews are going to start beheading Christians under the seven laws of Noah? I said, what, what on earth are you talking about? And she said, yeah, I've, I've been hearing that, that you know, the guillotines have been getting ready. And I said, there's no more chance that Jews are going to start beheading Christians over the seven laws of Noah than that Santa Claus is coming down your chimney. Next thing I get flooded with the craziest attacks and the most vile stuff and see YouTube channels with far more subscribers than mine and far more views than our videos. And they're all saying the same stuff. <clears throat> so here's, here's the understanding. Traditional Judaism says God gave the 613 commandments to the children of Israel, the Torah and the oral Torah and all of that, the traditions. But for Gentiles to be righteous, they just have to keep the so-called seven laws of Noah, which are allegedly derived from Genesis 2 and Genesis 9. It's really rabbinic exegesis that, that comes up with these. But they include the prohibition against blasphemy, prohibition against idolatry, prohibition against murder, adultery, uh, call to set up courts of justice, prohibition of theft. Uh, you can't eat the, the uh, limb of a living animal. Uh, and that's it. So if a Gentile keeps those, then a person's righteous. Well, there's been a debate in Jewish history over whether a Christian is an idol worshiper or not, because a Christian says that God is triune and that Jesus is God. Well, some say they are idol worshipers. Well, hang on. What's, according to Maimonides in the 12th century, what's the penalty for disobeying the seven laws of Noah, for committing idolatry, beheading, death by beheading? And, and seven laws of Noah become very popular. The United States recognizes them. Different presidents recognize them, the importance of seven laws of Noah. And in point of fact, rabbis and Christians, even Muslim leaders around the world have worked together to say, hey, we agree on this. And the larger consensus that has emerged in Jewish teaching is that Christians are not idol worshipers. Now, me as a Jew, they would say I'm an idol worshiper. But for a Gentile Christian to worship God in triunity, they'd say it's wrong, but it's not idolatry. Oh, no, 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 this is just a trick to get all these nations to recognize the seven laws of Noah. So somehow communist China is going to recognize the seven laws of Noah with the Jews in charge. The radical Muslim world is going to recognize the seven laws of Noah with the Jews in charge. America is just going to turn over control to the Jews and they're going to start beheading Christians. You say there's, 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 no, there's no way, there's no way, 
possible to, to <laughs> think anyone believe this. Oh, friends, check this out. Again, I'm not exaggerating. This is one website after another. The Noahide laws and planned guillotine genocide of all Christians and non-Jews worldwide. When it comes to the Noahide laws and the seven laws of Noah, seriously, you should be terrified. Most people in the world have no knowledge of the Noahide laws. These laws will cause the death of men. And the question is, are you prepared? Let's be blunt. This blog post is a complete denunciation of the Noahide laws. These are anathema to the followers of the truth in Mashiach, who is the way, the truth, and life. And what happens when someone like me exposes the lies about the Noahide laws? It's a tiny, tiny little sampling. Let's see. Well, Dr. Brown, you're an absolute liar. You claim the Noahide laws are related to Scripture, Acts 15. I always knew something was wrong about you. You always seem proud of your intellectual knowledge, calling yourself doctor, but you also lack zeal and passion. We worship God through the Lord Jesus Christ spiritually, not by knowledge as God is spirit. We keep faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through our faith and walk with Jesus through his Holy Spirit. Why are you deceiving Christians? What is your true agenda? Dr. Brown, why would you lie and deliberately deceive Christians? You have explained it to do to Christians. How can you lie to bodies of our Lord Jesus Christ? If you are such a Christian, why do you support the Noahide laws? You are not a Christian. You are a Talmudic Jew, just like any Pharisee that Jesus rebuked, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And by the way, so I, don't, I don't support the Noahide laws. I support preaching Jesus to the world. That's what I support. But you're misrepresenting the Noahide laws. Oh, no. Jew worshiping Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown is an ignorant man and has not enough information to defend his position. Stop worshiping Jews. He's a foolish man. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. That's addressed to me. You are leading the flock to hell, Dr. Michael Brown, so we know that Jews are allowed to lie about their ancestry, etc. You had better expose the truth about the seven Noahide laws, for hell awaits you in the lake of fire. You're in bed with the deep state because you flip-flopped on Noahide laws that are not Torah. Their plan is to kill all Christians. <laughs> in bed with the deep state also. Brown, you're a Kabbalist, so Jewish mysticism. That's easy to spot by the blank that comes out of your filthy lying mouth. Wipe that blank eating grin off your face, Brown. You're a shill blank gatekeeper. By the way, when I say tiny sampling, I mean tiny. I mean a few comments out of hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands just like this. For what? Exposing E. Michael Jones' anti-Semitism, exposing Rick Wiles' anti-Semitism, or here just for telling the truth about the Noahide laws. So very briefly, what's happening today? Well, there are theological roots, nothing new under the sun, supersessionism, replacement theology, that one way or another says the promises that were once given to the Jewish people of old now belong to the church exclusively, and God is done with the nation of Israel in any salvific way. An individual Jew can be saved, but as a nation, no promises remain. Modern state of Israel has no connection to the promises of God. The old idea that the Jews killed Jesus, allegedly with New Testament support, meaning that every Jew of all time is somehow responsible for the death of Jesus. And Jews by nature are Christ killers or God killers. These are some of the things that are fueling contemporary Christian anti-Semitism or misuse of Revelation 2 and 3, which speaks of some who claim to be Jews and are not, and were persecuting believers. Now, for sure, there were Jews like Saul of Tarsus and others that persecuted Christians in other cities, or that tried to use their, their Jewish status, that Judaism was a recognized religion in Rome, but new religions were not recognized, therefore Christians could be persecuted. There's some evidence in some places they did instigate persecution, and those could be the very ones that Yeshua is rebuking. You claim to be Jews, but you're not living as Jews. Or they could be Gentiles that claim to be Jews and were not. Either way, he calls them the synagogue of Satan. This is now the way that all Jews worldwide are thought of, synagogue of Satan. These are some of the theological roots of contemporary Christian anti-Semitism. There's also anti-Zionism. There is, there is a valid criticism of Israel. True friends of Israel can criticize Israel. But there's something that goes even further. It demonizes Israel. Israel, out of all nations on the earth, is the most guilty. Israel practices genocide and apartheid. And then delegitimizing Israel. The modern state of Israel has no right to exist today. And then Israel is, is an expression of world dominion because the Jews, remember, want to take over the whole world, right? Jews want to take over the world. And Israel is kind of the, the central 
point of that. And then today, today's the day of conspiracy theories. Come on, how many theories have you heard about the COVID virus, COVID-19? Or have, have you heard that it's, it's caused by 5G cell towers? Have, have, I mean, and I'm not an expert on all the conspiracy, conspiracy theories, but they are almost endless, almost endless. Well, that fits perfectly with the Jews. Same old, same old, the, the reprinting and distribution of the protocols of the elders of Zion, the secret cabal of Jewish leaders that's waiting behind the scenes to take over the world. Hey, look at all the Jewish influence in the media. Look at all the Jewish influence in the banks and the Jews are disproportionately powerful. Those evil Jews. Today's Jews are not really Jews. They're imposters. They, they claim to be Jews, but they're not. Now this takes on another meaning that we are all descendants of the Khazar kingdom about 1,100 years ago, allegedly converted en masse to Judaism, and we're their descendants, so we have no connection to the ancient Jews, so even those promises have no relevance to us. America's run by Jews. Just look around. Look at all the Jewish influence. Look at the, it doesn't matter we've never had a Jewish governor, right? It doesn't matter that we've never had a Jewish president, vice president, but obviously, the Jews run everything because Jared Kushner, right? Jews, president's son-in-law, connections with Chabad. See, Chabad's trying to take over. These ultra-Orthodox Jews trying to take over. These are some of the things that are believed. And the problem with the conspiracy theory is that facts don't matter. If, if you present a factual answer, that proves that you're trying to cover up the truth. America's moral problems are caused by Jews. Look back the origins of the sexual revolution, the pro-abortion movement. Unfortunately, I mean, these are the claims. Unfortunately, you have radical left-wing Jews like George Soros, who funds a lot of the stuff that we really differ with. Or the ACLU, which has so much Jewish influence. Uh, or the Southern Poverty Law Center, so much Jewish influence. And they are often on the very wrong side of the key moral cultural issues of the day. So there's all the fuel you need for this fire. Evil Jews. So what do we do in response? What do we do in response? First thing, get educated. The, the purpose of this talk was, was a wake-up call. The purpose of this talk was to get you saying, oh, oh my, I had no idea. This is happening on our watch. Yes, our watch, right here, our watch. Get educated. I've been watching what's happening in America and talking with a colleague and so you, you start to get an idea of how a Holocaust could happen because little by little there's the blaming and, and, and then things start to go more wrong. You need a scapegoat and, and, and then you have a deeper theological root. Thankfully in America, American evangelicalism has been strongly pro-Israel. Uh, the, the European Christianity in both Catholic and Protestant circles before the Holocaust was decidedly anti-Jewish in many ways. Uh, so we have a better heritage here, but things can shift on a dime. So first thing, get educated. Uh, if you haven't read Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, I'd really encourage you to, you can pre-order the book on contemporary Christian anti-Semitism uh, as well. You can pre-order that coming out in October. You can do that on Amazon. Second thing is, is speak the truth and whatever platform you have, say, Dr. Brown, I don't have 600,000 people on my Facebook page. Do you have 50? Do you have 100? Do you have an Instagram account? Do you have a Twitter account? Do you, do you have friends? Do you talk to people at work? Do you, whatever your circle is, speak the truth. Speak the truth. You hear lies about the Jews, pray for wisdom, best way to respond. Don't, don't just react. Get the truth out. Get the truth out. And have some good resources. Uh, we have an online uh, bibliography that goes with our hands are stained with blood. So when you have the book and you just get online and, and, and look for that. And, and, or you can just get that independently. And we give you lots of resources. Here are useful places to go. Um, and, and just a couple things. Jot down camera.org. Camera like the word camera. C-A-M-E-R-A dot -E org. That's accuracy in Middle Eastern reporting. Go there once a week and see what's happening. Or go to, to Pal, Pal Talk, which is, is um, a study of what's being re uh, reported, taught on TV, uh, putting out social media uh, among the Palestinians. You'd be shocked about some of the radical talk that goes there, paltalk.com, or memorytv.org, M-E-M-R-I-T-V.org, memorytv.org. 
this will give you sermons from the Muslim world. There'll be, you'll have the actual text in Arabic or, 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 or Farsi in, uh, in video with transcriptions. Just, just see what's being said. See what's out there. And then pray for God's purposes for Israel and the Jewish people. Prayer is always the, the greatest weapon we have, getting on our knees, crying out to God for his will to be done, for his purposes to be fulfilled. And then number four, stand righteously with Israel and your Jewish communities. Uh, maybe you're a Christian, you have no connection to the Messianic Jewish movement. Uh, go to the local synagogue. Ask your pastor if you do it, or if you're a pastor and leader. Meet with the rabbi and say, listen, we just want you to know that if anyone comes against you, we're standing with you. And that if, if you're ever physically threatened, they're going to have to get to us before they get to you. Let them know that. It makes a difference, especially coming from sincere Christians. It makes a difference. And stand with Israel. And you're voting. Doesn't mean Israel's perfect. Doesn't mean we can't criticize Israel. Let's stand together with Israel. Number five, we're almost done. Don't give up Jewish evangelism because of your support for the Jewish people. There is a Christian Zionism that fights against Jewish evangelism because of the terrible history of, 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 of church proselytizing and things like that, missionizing, forced conversions, baptism or death. But that's the wrong reaction. The right reaction is say, hey, we're going to stand with you whether you believe in Jesus or not. We love you. We stand with you. But we pray for everyone to come to know Yeshua the Messiah. So don't give up on Jewish evangelism. And may I encourage you without shame, support our work. We are uniquely positioned, friends, because God's given us a great platform through radio, through TV, through writing, through internet, to reach millions of people. And we're doing two things. We're reaching out to our Jewish people with the good news of the Messiah, and we're resisting the rising tide of anti-Semitism. So you can stand with us, askdrbrown.org, click on donate, and find out about becoming a monthly supporter, monthly partner. You help amplify our voice to put out more and more quality videos, more and more quality material books that will help more people. Together, friends, we can turn the tide against so-called Christian anti-Semitism, and we can get back to the gospel and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So there's some pretty heavy content here, but my goal, like I said, was to wake us up to reality. All right, now we will take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I, I do also just want to uh, reiterate um, a recommendation for Dr. Brown's ministry, askdrbrown.org. If you are interested in contributing, we do want to encourage you to do that. I don't know of anyone who is tackling this subject like Dr. Brown is uh, with his written materials. Our Hands Are Stained With Blood is a essential book to read for anyone, particularly anyone in vocational ministry. And so whether you're a church leader here or just an individual, I highly, highly encourage you to support this. As you can see, Dr. Brown is fighting on the front lines. Um, I have not been called uh, by expletives any time within the last week, and Dr. Brown probably has numerous times. So you just see he's, he's a very courageous person. I really want to encourage you to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was excellent. Uh, always so appreciated. This is such an important topic. We've had a lot of people answering or asking questions here. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a broad one, and then uh, Dr. Rudolph, who's joining us here, is going to dive into some of the questions that have been proposed by some of the attendees. Um, you know, I'd just like to ask your input, Dr. Brown, uh, for anyone who is a pastor here, um, you gave a great list of practical uh, things here, but, you know, there's a lot of issues that pastors are having to deal with, particularly right now. Um, we did a survey recently with Barna. Uh, that will come out later. But one of the questions we asked is how important do you feel or how, how concerned are you about anti-Semitism? And um, it, it ranked very low. In fact, only 17% of about 500 senior Protestant pastors answered it even like a seven or above. So how could, you know, what do we do for pastors to just get an understanding of why this is important to them and then how they can integrate it into their church? Yeah, the first thing we have to do is, is have understanding and recognize that your average pastor has, has a lot on his plate. And that, you know, even if you ask how important is, is it to you to, to deal, say, with the subject of abortion, you think that would be super high for everyone. But by and large, you're thinking, okay, I've got a flock to care for. I've got to, you know, preach a few messages a week or one message a week. 
we've got this couple in marital crisis. You know, we're trying to develop an effective discipleship program. We're looking to reach our neighborhood. You know, we've had a crisis of sickness with children. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff on your average pastor's plate. And we always think that what's important to us should be important to everybody, especially this. I mean, come on, the Jewish people, anti-Semitism, how could it not be? So first thing is, is to, to be compassionate in, in your response and, and not to be judging them as uncaring. It may be a blind spot, but they may just have a lot of other things to deal with. Um, that, and therefore you pray that God, don't, don't pray your agenda, say, Lord, whatever is important to you, for your children, for your shepherds, lay on the heart of your shepherds. So let's, let's pray them into this conviction. Um, we have seen many whose hearts and lives were dramatically changed by reading our hands are stained with blood. So if you offer, hey, I know you got a lot on your plate, but would you mind taking a look at this book? And here's an immediate tie. Isn't it interesting that in these, these anti-racism rallies in America and other nations right now, that Jews are being attacked. Isn't it odd that in the spirit of anti-racism, a massive rally in France, they're calling dirty Jews and, and indicting the Jews because of their alleged mistreatment of Palestinians. And, and that, you know, in Los Angeles, synagogues were vandalized, uh, but with anti-Semitic graffiti during some of the recent riots. So to say, you know, there's something else going on here. Or try to say, are, do you, do you care about the return of Jesus? Is that, does that matter? Something that they would see as important. Or even say, you know, Paul wrote the Gospels to the Jew first. Do you think that has any relevance today? Just something to draw them in. But above all, pray that whatever God wants them to be burdened with, they'd be burdened with. And get some things in their hands. If they're willing, then their eyes will be open. And then from there, this could be some, become something important. They recognize it's not peripheral. This is part of the Gospel. Dr. Brown, uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful teaching lecture. One of the questions we received was from um, Robert, who asked, um, what is your view of the relationship of preterism and Christian anti-Semitism? What I'd like to do, though, is ask you to broaden that to replacement theology more generally. Sure. How, right. how closely related is replacement theology to the... To the um, to the formation of Christian anti-Semitism. Right. So replacement theology, again, supersessionism, broadly states that God's promises to Israel no longer apply to physical Israel, but to the church, or that the role that Israel was once given in terms of God's plan of salvation is now given over to the church. In one of your books, Dr. Rudolph, you, you quote N.T. Wright and others, and it's, it's somehow a, a transferal theology because no one wants to say replacement theology because that's a bad word. But, but somehow I explain it like this. This used to be my cell phone. God promised it would always be mine. Now it's your cell phone. Something got root. Some, it used to be mine. It's now yours. So there are Christians today who hold to replacement theology who are not anti-Semites. Uh, they don't believe Israel's fulfillment of prophecy, but they're not anti-Semites. And they recoil over the horrors of, of anti-Semitism in church history. But there's no denying that replacement theology opened the door, prepared the way for, paved the way for anti-Semitism in church history. That, that's absolutely undeniable. I had done a review of Dan Cohn Sherbach's book on the crucified Jew some years ago and stated that in the review that while there are people today who hold to replacement theology who are not anti-Semites, you, you must admit that that paved the way because the Jews no longer especially blessed or have special promises. Instead, the Jews are especially cursed or of all peoples discarded. Now, here's how preterism sharpens this. Uh, preterism, uh, which is simply saying that many of the promises that most Christians look forward to in the future have already been fulfilled. They've already come to pass. Preterism sees the destruction of the temple in the year 70, the destruction of the second temple, as a definitive act by God against the people of Israel. It was God's final no. Let's say he gave him three strikes. You rejected Moses, you rejected the prophets, you rejected the Messiah, you are forever cursed. Individual Jews can be saved, 
but you are forever cursed. They, of course, they would also say that's the second coming that, that took place at that point. But in terms of anti-Semitism, uh, preterism is, is also uh, reviving today. It's becoming more and more popular. And there are definitely direct anti-Semitic implications that come out of preterism. Senator Brown, we've got a question here I thought, I thought was interesting. Um, this is from Cameron, uh, who writes, one of my best friends is Palestinian. Obviously, there's a lot going on over there. But how would you defend Jewish people to someone who was raised with an anti-Semitic mindset? Yeah, I, I would first say, listen, I, I'm not saying Jews are perfect. In no way I'm saying that Jews are perfect or defending everything Israel does. But I just ask him, how well do you know history? You know, with the Peel Commission in was it 1937 thereabouts, where the, the British leaders came to Arab leaders and came to Jewish leaders and said, okay, we're going to partition the land here. So the Arabs, you get this big part here, the Jews, this little part. There was debate among the Jews among it, but many Jewish leaders said, let's do it. Arab leaders all said, no, no. Okay, 1947, UN partition plan. The Jews accept it. There are quotes from Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir saying, stay, you are our neighbors, you are our friends, stay here with us, there's room in the land for everyone. The Arab leaders overwhelmingly said, no, we will destroy the Jews, drive them into the sea. And that is by and large what led to the expulsion of over 600,000 Palestinians. Now, now, many did flee because of the war. I'm sure there were some atrocities committed by the Israelis in the midst of the war. But Israel said, okay, let's have one nation here. We, there's room enough for everybody. And, you, and, and you, you're here, you're here. If we live side by side, great. The Arab leaders rejected that. So the whole two-state solution that's being argued for was rejected twice already. All right. You say, oh, but I don't know. I, there's a dispute about that history. Okay. Well, let's ask this, 200,000 Arabs stayed in Israel with the founding of the state. Okay, those 200,000 are now over 1.5 million in Israel today. They have voting rights. They make up over 10% of the Knesset, the parliament. They can burn the Israeli flag if they want. They have full rights to do that. They have more liberties than any other Arabs living in the Middle East. If you ask your average Palestinian, would you rather be under Hamas or Palestinian Authority or under Israeli rule? Most would actually say under Israeli rule. So if, if the Israelis are such monsters and they're guilty of genocide, why haven't they wiped out the, the Arabs living among them, the Palestinians living among them? So I, I would say, look, if the Palestinian leaders truly wanted peace and wanted to live side by side with their Jewish neighbors, things would be great. And I would say probably your average Israeli and your average Palestinian wants that. But there's been corrupt leadership. And, and I've, I've even talked to Palestinian Christians who very much oppose Israel's treatment of Palestinians, but they do not trust their own leadership. So I'd say, hey, look, tell me your viewpoint. I, I want to know what you've experienced and how you see the Israelis and so on. And you listen, understand, see where there's validity, but then, then paint a picture of the other side. And again, ask if the Israelis are so evil, what happened to the 200,000 Arabs that live there and now are a million and a half plus today? Dr. Brown, um, we have a question from Diego. He asks, why does Peter tell random Jews that they killed Jesus, even though they really did not, because they were not even there? You mentioned it in your lecture, but could you pack that. How, how could a Christian today respond to that kind of, that claim that the Jews killed Christ? Right. So when, when you read the prophetic literature in the Hebrew Bible, the nation is often indicted. The leaders are often indicted in broad terms. Isaiah 1, the prophet speaks to the leaders as the leaders of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and says, when you lift up your hands in prayer to the people, I won't listen to your hands are filled with blood. So there's no question that prophetic speech can be generalizing. If it would be if God said to America, you have killed over 60 million babies in abortion. But I didn't do that. You didn't do that. No, but our nation did. If God said to the church, the blood of the unborn is on your hands. Why? Because we didn't do sufficient uh, work to stop it. Mm -hmm. So in point of fact, when Peter makes these broad statements, in Acts 2, 
Read Acts 2.36, let the whole house of Israel know that this Yeshua whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Messiah. And in Acts 3, where he says, you crucified him. Notice first that he says, you did it in ignorance. Acts 3. Therefore, God wants to have mercy on you and give you repentance. Mm -hmm. So it's not even spoken to condemn. It's spoken to say you're guilty, but God wants to forgive. That's, that's a very different message than what the church taught through the centuries. The second thing is, the very people that were involved were likely there. The, the corrupt high priest or some of the leaders that were complicit in turning him over. I mean, he's, Peter's speaking to Jewish crowds in Jerusalem, at, at, at initially at Shavuot, at the Feast of Weeks. So, so key people are gathered and the people of Jerusalem, some of them may have been among the crowd that shouted, crucify him. And the people as a whole didn't stop it from, from happening. So he makes that indictment in, in true prophetic form. But it's those people. If you'll notice, say in Acts 13, Paul preaching in Pisidia and Antioch, he doesn't say that. Those people were very much unrelated. So it's in Jerusalem where you had some of the same people involved. He can make that statement on a national level. But you can't make it today to this generation because they're unconnected with it. This generation is responsible for what they do with the good news of Messiah. But there was a specific message spoken to specific people at a specific time. When you trace through Acts and see where other messages are preached, they don't preach that same thing to Jews in other parts of the world that were unconnected from it. Even in 1 Thessalonians 2, which, which is considered to be an anti-Semitic passage, and, and Paul indicts all Jews, what he's saying is the same Judeans who in the past killed the prophets and killed the Messiah, they're after us now. They're persecuting us too. So he's very specific. Thank you. Dr. Brown, we've got a couple of questions in here about particularly the Messianic Jewish movement. Uh, how do you, uh, as a Messianic Jew yourself, um, see the responsibility or um, uh, the role of the Messianic Jewish movement in speaking as really the bridge between all Israel and then the, the believers, the non-Jewish believers in the church. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to, to say one thing and then ask Dr. Rudolph to, to finish this. Uh, the term Messianic Jew can be used in one of two ways. It can be used generically for any Jewish follower of Jesus, or it can be used specifically for someone who attends a Messianic Jewish congregation and in a very intentional way is seeking to live a Jewish lifestyle in light of the, the new covenant and in the spirit. So broadly speaking, Jewish believers in Yeshua are, are a constant reminder of the church's calling to reach Jewish people. There was dual covenant theology. God has one covenant for Jews and one for Gentiles. Like, no, no, we, we want our people to know the message and to remind people that God has specific purposes for Israel that remain. We are here to, to kind of be that remnant witness. And what's interesting is when you speak specifically of a Messianic Jewish congregation, that you can have a mega church in your city, and maybe it has, if you're in a like city like New York or LA, you might have 500 Jews in it. You might have more. And yet the Jewish community as a whole is kind of oblivious to that and unconcerned by it. You have one Messianic Jewish congregation that follows the biblical calendar with 50 people, 30 of whom are Jews, and the Jewish community is much more aware of that because Messianic Jews are shouting, you can be Jewish and believe in Yeshua at the same time. So David, maybe you could even comment on the role of Messianic Jewish congregations within the, the church as a whole, that specific role that, that, that they would play. Yeah, I think... I think, uh, I think you're exactly right, Dr. Brown, that Messianic Jewish congregations are that, that part of the body of Messiah that can help lead the way in throwing up the flag on this issue of Christian anti-Semitism. And, um, and we need our, our Gentile Christian brothers and sisters to join us in, in, um, in partnering together in this uh, important work. Um, but we are certainly one of the first ones to feel it and to realize it and to sense it. And, and so we're so grateful that you are part of, part of this community and kind of lead the way for us in this area. 
I, we just recently had at the university a, an essay contest. Um, a, it was actually a, a scholarship contest. And one of the um, <clears throat> students wrote in, it was, uh, the topic was on the whole issue of uh, anti-Semitism today. And one of the students wrote in <clears throat> and said um, in his video presentation, uh, we all need to emulate Dr. Brown. And I just, I really, I, I was just so thrilled because we had, uh, we had this uh, lecture coming up. And so I just wanna thank you as somebody within our community who can help us in that regard. So, oh, that's very gracious. I, I appreciate that. And, and let, let me say something very interesting. We've noticed this for decades. There was um, a Christian leader, James Rudin, who began to bring evangelical leaders and rabbis together at the same table. And whenever you have interfaith dialogue, you'll see that one group is conspicuously missing, and that's Jewish believers. Because that kind of messes up the whole formula there. Because like exactly. Christians, Jews gonna come, and, and a lot of good comes out of that, but we're like, excuse me, excuse me, do uh, you think you would have let Paul in or Peter in? Because we're in like the contemporary, contemporary uh, version of that. And um, you know, a lot's happened though, even though the Messianic movement in America still struggles in certain ways to, to find its voice and its meaning. In Israel, it's much more natural for, you know, with lifestyle and things like that. Uh, but a lot of things that were just considered way out, you know, the church recognizing the prophetic significance of the biblical calendar or joining together for Sukkot celebrations or even prayerfully analyzing the Sabbath and stuff. There's just a lot of stuff that the, the church is talking about more. So there's been a reconnecting with Jewish roots, which has been really healthy. And the Messianic movement has helped pave the way for that. Dr. Brown, here's a question from Mark regarding <clears throat> uh, an issue you raised already in the lecture. Uh, he asks, what would you say about the belief by some <clears throat> Gentiles that they are descendants of the 10 tribes of Israel? Or someone named Benjamin Friedman who claims that those in Europe who call themselves Jews are actually Khazars from Central Asia. Yeah, so the whole Khazar theory that, uh, that I mentioned, of course, I take up again and our hands are stained with blood, is one of the ideas that today's Jews are not really Jews, especially Ashkenazi Jews. So that would be someone, someone like me or someone like David or a, her or a heritage. I'm like 90% Ashkenazi, 10% Sephardic, that Ashkenazi Jews are not really Jews. And therefore, the ones that Hitler was slaughtering weren't really Jews, and, and so on. And obviously, there's been a lot of intermarriage. So that's why you have uh, Ethiopian Jews, and that's why you have Caucasian Jews, and that's why you have Asian Jews. So as Jews were scattered around the world, and there was intermarriage out, that resulted in assimilation and the end of that Jewish line. But there was intermarriage in, people like Ruth, so you live in a community long enough, people convert to Judaism, marry in. So now you're going to take on the complexion of all these different groups. But the Hazar theory breaks down for a number of reasons. One, the, the total number of people who apparently converted in Central Asia was not that massive from what we could understand. So this would make up a tiny, tiny percentage of the people. And then when you do test, uh, when you test things linguistically, when you look at geographical history and where people were at different times, when you look at DNA, it, it ultimately breaks down. What's fascinating is that uh, there is what's called the, the, the priestly gene. Uh, and it's, it's basically saying that you can trace those who, who claim to have priestly lineage, many times someone with the last name Cohen, Kohen, priest in Hebrew, uh, when you trace it back, you trace back the name, the ancestry, and, and then do a, a DNA analysis, you find that there's a common gene going back to a Middle Eastern ancestor over 3,000 years ago, which would primarily, presumably be Aaron. What's fascinating, though, is that, that that gene has been found among the Lemba tribe in Zimbabwe, which claims to have priestly heritage, and many Jews who have this last name Kohen or something related to it, so here you have, even among Ashkenazi, yeah, this, this tracing back to, uh, to Aaron, presumably, and then the Jewish people as a whole, ancient people of Israel, by DNA. Now, there's a lot of conflicting DNA evidence, but the best science 
does clearly point in this direction. Uh, as to the idea that the Europeans or the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel or England, British Israelitism, or Americans, you know, some of the claims the Mormons would have, again, those break down on several levels. One is DNA, and, and another is, is history. That, that there are archives, there are chronicles, there are things where we can trace this group was here, this group was here. So these are just some of the common myths. And it ends up again with some type of anti-Semitism that today either you are a Jew and you're therefore guilty. It's like, well, hang on, I thought you just told me I'm not a Jew because I'm Ashkenazi, that I'm a descendant of the Khazars, that I'm not a Jew, but you're telling me I'm especially evil because I am a Jew. So it's, it's one way or the other. Either you're not Jews at all, so the promises don't belong to you, or you are a Jew and therefore you're evil. But of course, they're mutually contradictory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a, um, uh, a really good question. It was asked anonymously, Dr. Brown. Um, it says here, there are many Christians who believe in generational sin. Uh, the idea that we inherit certain sins or predispositions to sin from our parents or uh, previous generations. Does this suggest that Jewish people inherited an anti-Jesus nature based on Matthew 27, 25, where Pilate is asking the crowd for Jesus or Barabbas. They say, give us Barabbas. And of course, then the, the Jewish crowd says, let his blood be on us and on our children. Maybe you could speak to that because it ties into this idea that uh, the Jews killing Jesus. And, and I think, but I do think that this is a stumbling block for a lot of Christians because they don't know how to navigate some of these scriptures that seem to, yeah. you know, r really be tricky. Well, that's why I deal with them uh, in Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, as well as in volume one of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. So we have all the answers out there, and, and others are written as well. So first, Matthew 27, 25, there's a Jewish crowd. It's not the whole people. It's not the whole nation. It's not even all the leaders. It's a crowd uh, that says crucify him. All right, so that's the, they don't have the power to bring a curse on the entire nation through all history. Uh, they're not even all the representative leadership. But at worst, what they call for happened, the, the saying his blood be on us and on our children means we take responsibility. Catholic scholar Raymond Brown, who can be critical, skeptical of the historicity of certain parts of the New Testament, says that this seems very legitimate in the crowd scene. And what they're basically saying, we take responsibility, let it fall on us and our children, which it did. The next generation suffered terribly. Temple was destroyed. That's it. There, there's no way to bring a curse on posterity for all time. What Paul says in Romans 11, in verse 28, is that they may be enemies now uh, for your sake, for the gospel, but they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So God's eternal love is still on Israel. His promise at the end of the age for national repentance, all Israel will be saved, remains the same. But, but here's what has been inherited. If, if I reject Yeshua as the Messiah and I continue to develop new traditions as Judaism grows and develops from Pharisaical Judaism to Rabbinic Judaism in the first centuries of this era. So it's a Judaism that does not believe in Yeshua and continues to develop in the direction of the Pharisees and, and their traditions and teachings and so on. Uh, I teach that to my children, they teach that to their children, their children. It, you don't have to say a negative word about Yeshua, you don't have to mention him by name at all, but you're simply teaching, we believe something else. So a traditional Jew has a whole system of belief, much of it beautiful, uh, some of it neutral, some I'd say is, is, is very wrong, but it exists without Yeshua. In the same way Muslims, uh, let's, let's say you, you, you preach to people in the days of Muhammad, and they reject your gospel message, but follow Muhammad. Now the next generation, next generation, as the generations go on, it's not so much a hardening in sin. It's not so much a penalty, Matthew 27, 25, specifically being poured out on Jewish people. It's just the result of generational teaching. In other words, we reap what we sow. So we reject the Messiah. Now you have church history and the anti-Semitism in church history pushing Jewish people away. So now there's blood on the church's hand as, as, as well. Jesus seems even more foreign to Jewish people. There's reactionary literature against it, speaking evil of Jesus and so on. Now you have this vicious cycle, but it's not a curse being passed down from Matthew 27, 25. And, and I like rather to take it as a prayer. Yes, let his blood be on our people. You know, let the blood of Messiah wash away sin and cleanse. Romans 11, Paul says that there's been hardness or a veil 
So again, that's a result of the generation rejecting Messiah and now teaching that next generation, next generation, this is what happens. But it's not a, a corporate judgment eternally for the sin of that first generation. Nor is there a hint in scripture, as we said, that all Jews through all time are guilty of the death of Jesus. And point of fact, if, if I asked any born-again Christian, uh, why did Jesus die? The first answer is our sins. Was it the will of God? Yes, God gave him uh, for us out, out of his love. Uh, who killed Jesus? Many Christians say we did. It's our sins nailed him to the cross. That's right theology, not to blame Jews for all time for that. Dr. Brown, um, a number of the questions have alluded to the issue that in John's writings, in his gospel, as well as in Revelation, <clears throat> he refers to the Jews, and as you mentioned, the synagogue of Satan. You know, that, that kind of language could very easily fuel a kind of Christian anti-Semitism. How, yep. how would you respond? How, how should Christians view that kind of language in the translations? Yeah, so again, first, we have to say things were spoken in context, just like when God tells Moses, the people of Israel are stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Or when God tells Ezekiel, if I sent you to the, the Gentiles, they would listen, but not my people Israel. Or when he says through Isaiah, they're stiff-necked people, they're rebels for all time. So they're very, very harsh rebukes of the people as people because this is in-house. So the first thing we need to, to emphasize is that, you know, when Yeshua was having conflicts with religious leaders in, in Matthew, this is Jews with Jews. And just say, you know, it's, it's common in that literature of the day, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls and Josephus, they're attacking different Jewish groups with very, very strong language. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is who would be categorized as a synagogue of Satan? It's either people who claim to be Jews and they're not, so they're just Gentile imposters. But even if they were, it would be Jews who are actively involved in persecuting and killing Christians for preaching the gospel. If you want to say synagogue of Satan, it's, it's Jews doing that that are not living as Jews and that are doing Satan's work. You know, when you say, well, John 8, 44, you're of the fault, you're of the you're of your father, the devil. Well, what does Ephesians 2 say? That all of us by nature were children of wrath. What does 1 John 5, 19 say? We are of God, little children, and the whole world lies under the power of the evil. What does 2 Corinthians 4, 4 say? That the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So all humanity is under the power of Satan outside of God's grace. And in John's gospel, where Jews occurs a lot, many scholars recognize that it's, it's used in three different ways. It's, it's used to just refer to Jews generically, John 4, 22, salvation of the Jews. Or it's, it's used to, uh, uh, to speak of the Judeans. So uh, Yeshua doesn't want to go to Judea because he's afraid of Judeans. So the Jews who lived in Judea in particular, like John 7. Or John 9, that Jews really means Jewish leaders in particular. And that this, uh, this would have been a, a bit more nuanced and understandable. So you recommend a translation like Tree of Life, for example, <coughs> that, that lays these things out more clearly. So you say, yeah, I fully understand how this was understood. And this is part of the, the negative fallout that's come to us for rejecting the Messiah. We, we ended up you know, showing some of our worst at the worst time. But when rightly understood, uh, it, there's nothing anti-Semitic about this. Well, we hit 8.32. We want to be mindful of our commitment to everyone, although we could probably talk about this uh, and many of the questions that are still open and unanswered. Very good questions. We apologize. We don't have enough time to get to all of them. There's some very good questions in here, um, but we do want to encourage you to engage with Dr. Brown's ministry. Ask Dr. Brown. He does a live radio show, as he mentioned, where you can call in and ask these questions, and he engages with these kinds of topics on a daily basis. And so we want to thank you all for coming and being a part of this. Um, David, did you want to say anything here before we close out? No, just thank you so much, Dr. Brown. We're, we're very grateful to you and for your writings and just uh, for your leading the way in this area. Thank you. Well, great to be in it together. And for all those that are going to be in the class the next three days, we're just getting started. <laughs> God bless well, you, and uh, let's stay in touch. Make sure, friends, uh, join in via 
uh, getting on our email list at sdrbrown.org or connecting with us on Facebook or YouTube. This way, as we're writing, putting out videos, you can be the first to know. Well, my, I, I get the last question before I pray and uh, send us off into our Sunday evenings here. I, I would like to know who owns more books, Dr. Rudolph or Dr. Brown. <laughs> maybe, maybe you guys could submit your, submit your book list totals uh, on a sheet of paper and send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> we are really honored to know both of you. We're thankful for both of you. Thank you both for being such a blessing to the Gateway Center for Israel and really being foundational in our understanding of of approaching pastors with this uh, this mandate to love and biblically and sincerely the Jewish people. We're grateful for both of you. So I've, I'll say a prayer here to end us out, and then uh, we will end the meeting, and we'll all disappear into the internet evening here. So, Lord, we're so thankful that you loved humanity so much that you called a man named Abraham and made a covenant that you reiterated to his descendants to be a blessing to the world and to be a blessing to every family. Lord, we as Gen myself, as a Gentile addition to these covenant promises, I wanna bless the root of this tree that I've been grafted to, Lord. We want to, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, be a blessing to the Jewish people. And we pray that all this we have learned here you would, by your Holy Spirit, empower us, show us, Holy Spirit, how can we be a better advocate for the Jewish people in our community? And how can we better stand up to injustice and to sin and wrong? And we thank you for Dr. Brown. We pray that you would bless he and Nancy, bless their ministry, Lord, protect him, Lord, be a shield around him. And uh, we pray, especially for this class, that he uh, will be teaching at TKU in the coming days. Lord, give him strength and energy, and we pray a blessing over every person who has joined us here. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you tonight. In the mighty name of Yeshua, amen. 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 Well, thank you, everyone. We enjoyed you all being with us tonight, and again, we encourage you to engage with Dr. Brown on social media or via his email list. And we wish you all a very, very pleasant evening and a great week ahead of you. Goodbye.